good morning, Prescott Valley Bible Church. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Oh, good. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, I got a quick story for you, a real uh, uh, testimonial about, about how good God is for us. Um, Dee and I took our grandchildren uh, horseback riding the other day. First time ever that they had been horseback riding. My grandson's a little stick figure. He's all of maybe 50 pounds soaking wet, it seems like. Uh, Ace, and he was supposed to be on a horse named Rafiki. And uh, is that, yeah, no, he was supposed to be on a horse named Sheriff. D was supposed to be on Rafiki. And at the last second, they switched the horses of what, who was going to ride who. And so my grandson, like I said, a little, little guy, he was real intimidated by this big old horse. So the, one of the wranglers walked him around the compound a little bit to get him used to being on the horse. And my granddaughter, she was okay with it. Well, turned out, we, we started down the trail. Now, you got to understand horseback riding. This was more like walking. Okay, the horse is just walking. They follow the same line. They're probably as bored, you know. Oh, another, another rider on my back. Here we go, you know. Anyhow, having said that, about a quarter mile back from the stables, these in front of me, then my granddaughter Mia, and then Ace and myself. These horse stumbles and falls. Like a champ, <laughs> like the cowgirl that she really is deep down inside. She went down, rolled, got away unhurt, right? She broke her sunglasses. Wow. So God is good because she survived that. But the miracle is we were wondering, isn't it amazing at the last second they switched horses? It have been tough on the grandson, for sure. He would not be. I don't know. He's he's jiu-jitsu guy. He might have done even better. I don't know. But it was just ironic that they got switched at the last. And we don't know. We, we checked on the horse yesterday. Horse is okay. That was the main thing. We were more concerned about the horse. <laughs> <laughs> but Sheriff is okay. And I just wanted to share that with you about how good God is for us. Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Prescott Valley Bible Church. We're glad you're with us today. I want to give you a quick update on a few things. I don't know. I know I didn't send out a, a text to everybody, but it's concerning Russ. And I don't know if you know this or uh, if the, the message got out there at all, but Russ is in the Mayo Clinic right now. And he's uh, in that Mayo Hospital. And uh, they, they just told him that um, he has an end-of-life heart. End-of-life heart. Which means... He's going up to the top of the list for a heart transplant. And he also needs a kidney transplant as well. So you be praying for our, our buddy Russ and for his wife Crystal. You, know, you can imagine how stressful that is on her. And so just pray for her and uh, just pray for the whole, the whole family. Uh, also, um, continue to pray for the rest of our church family. A lot of people have been battling different things. Uh, poor Sherry was here today and went home early, so you were stuck with me singing next to Scott and, and uh, Cecilia. Um, but be praying for her and for Char and Belinda, and, and uh, really quite a few people are battling today. You know, it's, it's just like the devil to do that, right? To, to make people not feel well and make you think, maybe I should just stay home today, you know. But the word goes out no matter what, right? And God's in control. Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're in part two of the series titled Formed. Formed. And what we're doing is we're, we're looking at how God has formed us and continues to form us in our lives. As I was sitting here thinking, not here, but in my office, thinking about the message today, I started my message with a question. How long does it take to become a Christian? And I wrote that down on a piece of paper, and I just sat there and looked at it, and I'm just thinking, how long does it take to become a Christian? And the answer is really interesting, because the answer I came up with was, in a moment, 
and in a lifetime. It takes a moment and it takes a lifetime. Because here's what happens. When you and I accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we ask him to come into our lives. The Lord does that. We, we, you know, the Holy Spirit comes in us. We're saved. But here's what I realized when, when that happens. We're not mature in Christ. We're just like a baby. And we don't know anything. The only thing we know is that, God, I want you in my life. The rest of our lives is growing in maturity. The rest of our lives are part of becoming a Christian because we don't automatically, you know, when I, when I asked Jesus to come into my life, I didn't wake up the next morning and have God's wisdom just pouring out of me. I don't have it now. Do you get what I'm saying? It's something that comes over time as God teaches us from one thing to another, how do we mature in the Lord? I mean, you know, you, you don't take an infant baby and say, okay, hurry up and grow up. You might say that after changing their diapers a few times. But the reality is they don't grow up just like that. It takes time for them to do that. And for each one of us, it takes a lifetime. Here's, the, here's the, one of the things that we have to be careful of. Well, I'm mature in the Lord, and I already know everything there is to know. Because I've been a Christian now for, I've been a, do I want to tell you? I've been a Christian now for over 40 years. There's nothing new. I've read the Bible more than once. I mean, I'm one of these guys at one time uh, went from, Read the Bible in a year. And I did that a few times. And you know what? Wow, that was really something. That was really something. But it's not a race to the finish. For those of you who do that, I, I want you to know there's nothing wrong with that read the Bible in a year thing. But how about us, instead of trying to read the Bible within a year, how about learning something from what we read for a year? And taking time to meditate on what is being said to us. I mean, it's really, it's really that. And the world that we live in are trying to show us how we're supposed to be formed. It's supposed to tell us, they want to tell us how your life is supposed to be. And God says, I'm the director of your life. I'm the one who wants to show you what you need to know. I've been, I've been blessed and I've known many people who have been blessed with long marriages. They were married a, a very long time. I think of our buddy Gene who needs prayer also who was married for 60 something years. And, and I, I think about that and I think What's different between that marriage and some of the marriages we see today? And the more I thought about that, I thought, well, I think that when Jean got married, it was for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, till death do us what? Part. Right? Till death do us part. And I have to tell you that I've talked to people before, young people today, not all, but some, who say, well, uh, let's get married. We'll try it for a year or two and see what happens. See how it works out. And it, there's no out clause. There's no out clause. I, I, I look around the room and I know, man, all of you know exactly what I'm talking about because it, it's, it's something that's right in our faces. You know, I, I've, I've had conversations with people even just recently, that are going through difficult times, and they say, you know, when I started this relationship, I, I'm not in this relationship to be a caregiver. I'm in a relationship to have fun. No. 
I remember the better for worse sickness and in health till death do us part. See, friends, any relationship that you and I are going to have, it can't be one with contingencies. It can't be I love you until things are hard and then I don't love you anymore. Does this make sense? Here's where we're going with our message today. God wants to have an all-in relationship with us. He wants us to love him in season, out of season. He wants us to love him uh, with all of our hearts, with everything we have. He wants to be center of our lives. God wants to do things in our lives. And we're going to read about this word form in the Bible where God formed us certain ways that we're going to see a word that has the word form in it like the word transform he wants to transform us before I go further I want to take a moment and I want us to pray for our message today let's pray well dear Heavenly Father we we come to you this morning as Christ followers as hopefully future Christ followers and Lord, we just are seeking you in our lives. Lord, we understand that to be a child of God happens in a moment. But to grow in maturity takes a lifetime. To grow more into your likeness every day. And so, Father, in the things that we do, in the battles we face, in the challenges that happen in our lives, give us the wisdom and maturity to see you in everything that we go through. It's our prayer now that you would guide and direct us. Be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. See, God wants to transform marriages out there. He wants us to, to go from a singleness to kingdom-mindedness. Is that a word? Kingdom-mindedness. It's not a word, but I just made it up. Put it in the dictionary. You see, when you have a relationship with your spouse, isn't it interesting? It doesn't take long for you to know your spouse's voice. It doesn't take too long. Shirley used to call me up uh, at my office and say, hey, bring home some milk on the way home. She never said, uh, Andy Gambino, this is Shirley Gambino, uh, would you stop at the store and bring home some milk? She never had to do that. I knew her voice. I got to learn her voice. You see, uh, uh, have you ever seen, uh, Ron, have you ever seen old people in relationships? Old people in relationships, older people that have been married like you guys. I mean, the guys that have been married a long time. Like, like Bill, you know, he's been married a long time. You, you ever see couples like that and you ask a question and one guy starts answering and then his wife finishes the answer? You ever see that? You ever do that? Have you ever? It's amazing. How does that happen? How does that happen? My grandson used to come to me for advice and then he stopped because he didn't like the advice I was giving him. So, so, but he used to come to me advice, and then he would come to me after he made the mistake on his own, and he'd say, I need your help, I need your advice. And I'd say, why didn't you come to me before you made this decision? And he'd say, because I know you, and I know what you were going to say before I asked it, and I didn't want to do that. I says, well, sorry. Sorry. It's still, it's still you know, it, it's one of those things. Isn't it interesting that you and I have the ability to hear God's voice? We get to hear it through his word, through his teachings, through the challenges and trials that you and I face. I don't know about you, but when I face trials and challenges, I'm always praying 
Lord, remove this. Get this out of here now. And I know that it's going to take time for that to happen. So why don't we get used to saying, I don't like this, but what are you trying to teach me through it? Wouldn't it be terrible to go through a trial in your life and not learn anything? I, I, you know, I, I think that there's a phrase, don't worry, if you don't learn it this time, you'll go through it again and learn it next time. Right? And it's like, let's learn things first. So, so we have God who wants to transform us. We have the world that's trying to form us. In fact, I would say that on the contrary to even forming us, we have a world that's trying to misinform us, that's trying to be contrary to what God says. If you want to know what God says, see what the world says, and it's the opposite of what the world tries to sell us, tries to tell us. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. And we all who with unveiling fa faces can... can, can that, that word, I can't say it. Contemplate the Lord's glory and are transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. God is in the transforming business. He wants to take us from where we have been into where he wants to take us. You see, becoming a Christ follower, and I like calling it that, I think I talked about that last week, that when we say that we're Christ followers, there's no confusion about who we are. Jesus said it, we believe it, we're going to do it. But if I then say I'm a Christian, what I'm saying is, and I talked about this last week, you're calling yourself a little Christ. I think I'm a Christ follower. I'm not a little Jesus. I am one who's following what Jesus says. And so God wants to shape us. He wants to make us into the image of Christ. And that doesn't happen overnight. It happens in the things that we deal with every day. So we have to learn how to do life with God and not just for God, but learn how to walk in his way. So often, some of our brothers and sisters seem to think that being a Christ follower is an earned thing. You earn your way. You, you be good, you do good, you're a good person, you're wonderful, and you're so good that when you see Jesus, he's going to go, well, come on. Get off that line. Come to the head of the line because you're, you're special, Robert. But Robert knows better. <laughs> not that you're not special, Robert, but he knows better because the only way you and I are saved is through grace and the acceptance of Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He's not going to say, what did you do for me? He's going to say, did you know me? Did you walk in my way? Did you, did you seek me with all of your heart? He's going, to, he's going to look at this. And here's the thing. Sometimes, if we're honest, our answer is not all the time. I didn't seek you every day. I mean, I want to walk with you, Lord, but... Sometimes I feel stuck. Ever been stuck? Ever felt stuck? You know, uh, we grow up in a time where you can come to this church, you can drive down the street to another church, to another church, to another church, and they are all going to teach you something different. And the basic thing that God wants to know us to know is that he's in the transforming business. You don't have to get right 
to be right with God. You have to be right with God. And He will make your path straight. He will help you to be who He's calling you to be. So how do you and I grow in a deeper relationship with God? That's what we want to spend our time on today. I'm really coming up with like four things, but honestly, I could have come up with a hundred things, and you can too. But here are four basic things that I want to put in front of us today that I believe if we can implement this in our lives, we could grow in a deeper relationship with God. Here's number one. Here's what it's going to take, the first principle. Familiarity breeds similarity. Did you get that? The more, the more familiar I get with God, the more closer I could walk in His way. The more it comes into me and when I'm studying his word and when I'm allowing myself to take that in, you think about that and you go, man, this is, this is, you ever, ever answer something, ever answer something and you don't know where it came from and you find out it came from the Bible? You ever, you ever done that? You go, wow, I didn't even know I knew that, but it was in the Bible. So number one is familiarity breeds similarity similar i keep my my i had coffee this morning i shouldn't have had coffee this morning there's a story in the book of luke that we learn about and it's it's a, it's jesus and he's with the with the disciples and they're walking along and they're they're coming to this house and it has two people in there the two ladies that live there with their brother and it Mary and Martha, you know that story, right? Mary and Martha. I want you to see how Jesus is trying to teach how uh, being familiar helps us to be similar. Luke 10, verse 38 through 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparation that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Well, he's exp she's probably expecting Jesus to say, hey, get in there. Go help her. Verse 41. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but a few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. You know, Martha is, I don't know, do you ever, you ever know somebody who's really a, you could go to their house and they make a big dinner for you and they didn't even know you were coming? You know what I mean? You ever see those people that are like that, that they're always doing stuff, they're setting the table, they're cleaning, up. I'm one of those, they, 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 they're cleaning up, they're doing different things, and they're getting busy, and they're busy with all this stuff, and Jesus is in the family room talking, and instead of listening, she's making donuts in the other room or something. She's doing something, I don't know. She's doing baking. And Jesus says, what Mary is doing is the right thing. See, we, do you know we live in a world of distractions? Ever been distracted? There's a lot of distractions. I mean, let me tell you something. Uh, phones and cell phones and internet and TV shows and, and what, 
sporting events and, and all these different things that come at us. People at the door and, and, and it's just, it's never ending. It's never ending. I mean, there's an RV show coming up. It's during the weekend. And you could just go to the RV show and look at all these RVs in a stadium. And there's no cost. So come on down on Sunday and see it. See what I'm saying? And he's, he's going, yeah, raise the roof. It, it, it's one of those things. And you go, well, wait a minute. Sunday is a church day. I was talking to a doctor yesterday. Yesterday? No. Friday. Talking to a doctor Friday. And she says, Pastor. So she knew. She knew I was a pastor. She goes, I work six days a week. I work on Saturday. I work Monday through Saturday, and I have Sunday off. She goes, I guess that's my day off. And I said, no. It's the Lord's Day. I said, you're supposed to go to church that day. She goes, oh, she goes, that's right, Pastor Andy. She goes, okay, okay, I get, I get you saying that. But, you know, isn't that interesting that we could even be doing something good and be so busy at it that it replaces our time with God? Here's a point for your notes. All serving and no sitting will make you critical or cynical, rather, and sour. It'll make you cynical and sour. All serving and no sitting. See, if I'm not sitting to take time with Jesus and I'm serving all the time, God's calling us to be servants. We're supposed to serve. But we have to sit and take time with Him because you you know what happens if you serve all the time and you don't sit with Jesus? Why am I doing all the work and nobody else does anything around here? I mean, I'm doing stuff all the time and that person does nothing. And then I become cynical. I become a person who gets sour towards things. Well, you know what? I'm not going to do anything anymore because nobody else doesn't want to do anything and they don't care. And then I open up my Bible and Jesus came to serve, not to be served. And that's when I throw my Bible usually across the room. Because I'm reading that and I go, oh, you mean I'm supposed to be doing that? You mean I'm not supposed to look at what you do I'm supposed to look at myself and think about what I'm doing. You see, I need to be a person who seeks God in my life and does what God wants me to do. But if I leave the seeking part out, I could very easily get burned out and get washed out and say, I'm not doing anymore. You know, I think about Ron and Hope and how their ministry blossomed about helping people, helping kids and doing that. And you know, you know, I, I don't remember asking you, do you get like 200,000 a year for doing that or or what? Doesn't get anything for doing it. Why do you do that? Why do people do what they do and they just do it for nothing? Why do they do that? They do that because God put it on their heart. Because Jesus was a server. Because they have a passion for this and God put it in them. And you know, when you go about it that way, it makes a big difference. Because I'm no longer focused on you. I'm focused on me and what God wants in my life. John 16, 7 says this, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, 
the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Think about that. They've all been following Jesus, and Jesus says, it's good that I leave. I don't know about you, but I almost would like Jesus to be sitting in the front row here. And I would say, you mean to tell me it's better that you're not sitting in the front row? It's better that you left? Because Jesus at that time could only be at one place at a time. The Holy Spirit lives in the hearts of the believers. Lives in all of us. Lives in us. Directs our path. Guides us. That could never have happened if Jesus did, stayed it, it, it wouldn't have happened. So how do we grow spiritually? It's a point in your notes. You ready? The engine for spiritual growth comes on two rails. I want you to think about two rails. One is heart, and the other one is habit. Now, now if you can think about that, heart and habit. Now, sometimes we lean to one more than the other. There are denominations out there and uh, the, they lean towards the heart. And I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not picking on anything. The heart transformation or the heart rail is the one that says, if I don't feel it, it may not be happening. If I don't feel God's presence in my life, maybe he's on vacation this week. But yet, Habit tells us, the Bible tells us, by studying his word, habit-forming message, by studying his word, that he never leaves us nor forsakes us. It doesn't say he never leaves us or forsakes us if you feel him. Other people are like biblical days when I have to see miracles happening to know that God is here. And here's what I want to say to you. Every day you wake up, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. We have so much to be praising Jesus for because, man, every day is a new day. And there's a new opportunity every day in our lives. You see, it's not about feeling the presence of God. It's not about... It's not about that at all. Philippians 3, 8 and 9 says, What is more? I consider everything lost. This is the Apostle Paul talking, right, about his passion for God. So what, what is more? I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. See, Paul says, uh, I, it's not about me, it's about God. And that even when I go through things, God is with me. I can rejoice in that. You see, friends, each one of us have to understand that, that it's not about how we feel. It's about what God says. And so if I'm operating on the heart rail only, then I'm going to be moved by the wind. When things are bad, I'm going to think God is not around. <laughs> when things are bad, honestly, I don't know how true that what I'm going to just say is, but here's what I believe. I believe that God is never closer to me than he is when I'm going through difficult times. I believe that he is right there with me and he's, he's trying to help me through it. Every day of my life. He's trying to help all of us through it every day of our lives. So, 
When it comes to walking with God, we need two things. We need light and we need heat. We need light that comes from the Word. And we need to have passion for God. We need to walk in a way where, you know, everything is going to be all right. Um, the problem we have is that we're kind of in a we're kind of in a hurry world, aren't we? In a hurry world. The other night, I made dinner and ate it in five minutes. Stuck it in the microwave. It was done in a minute and a half. And I ate it. It was a burrito. And, and I ate it. And I was done in five minutes. It was horrible. It was horrible. But it was like, well, I'm just going to do this. I mean, I'm busy. I'm doing stuff. I'm just going to do this. See, we want everything right now. And when we want it right now, the quality goes way down. As the quality of life goes way down, we're looking for answers right now. So we have to develop habits to get us to go cro grow closer to him. Deuteronomy 31.6 says this. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you and he will what? Never leave you nor forsake you. I love that verse. I love that verse. I've had to stand on that verse. How about you, Teresa? Have you had to stand on that verse? How about you guys back there? I mean, we've, we've, all, we've all been there and we've said, we've got to stand on this. I don't know what's happening, but I know who's in control of it. Here's a point in your notes. We don't mature as a result of moments. We mature as a result of the mundane. In other words, we look for special moments to, guard, to, to get us over the top. But here's what you have to know. God creates the growth in those moments between the moments. In those everyday life experiences, in those things that we do every day, God is growing us in those. We have to build habits day by day to do stuff. I know people that, 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 that uh, uh, they don't go to this church, so I forgive them though, but, but, but they're always doing stuff at church to help the church, help the people do this and do that. And why do you do that? I do that because God wants me to. That's my thing. That's my thing. I get my thing. I get that. I understand how that works. See, for those of you who are married, and you, you need to wake up every day. Boy, this is a tough one for you guys to hear this. Do you know that love is a choice? You have to wake up every day choosing to love your spouse. Now, I know some of you spouses, and that's really a choice. You know what I'm saying? You really have to make a choice to do that because not everybody is so easy, right? Are we all easy? I know some people are not so easy. I won't name names, but you know what I mean, right? It's one of those things we have to choose to love. God wants us to choose to love him. See, it, every one of us, makes a choice every day. Am I going to walk in love or am I going to walk like the world? Is it going to be love based on the moment or is it going to be love based on the mundane, the everyday life? 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Having nothing to do with godless myths, and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value. But godliness has value for all things. Holding promises for both the present life 
and the life to come. Here's a little mathematical thing I put together. Here's what it says. Small, smart choices plus consistency plus time equals radical differences. If we just learn how to trust God in the small things, we make godly choices. If we do that consistently, and if we take time to understand God more, to know Him more, I guarantee you that it will make a radical change in your life. It will change you in a way you don't believe. Here are the four practical suggestions real quick because I think we've got 10 minutes left. Number one, practice the law of firsts. If you want to have the principle of walking and growing in your relationship, God has to be first. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your, your vats will brim over with new wine. Mark 1, 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus got up early in the morning. It was still dark out to pray, to get alone with God. Friends, for some of you, maybe you have to get up early in the morning, like when it's still dark. Can you imagine that? Getting up, it's still dark out. And pray. Jesus did that. See, for me, when I read that, you know what he modeled for me? This is just me. I need to put God first in my day. I need to get up and spend time with him first thing in the morning. And then it will change my day. It will help me in my day. Here's number two. Slow down and relax. Slow down and relax. How does that sound? Slow down and relax. You know, we, we're kind of in a hurry world, right? We live in a hurry thing. Hey, uh, uh, let's see. I'm supposed to spend time with God this morning, but I'm supposed to go to breakfast with uh, Larry or Bill or what, whoever it is. Uh, not Bill, but uh, whoever. You know, I'm supposed to go to breakfast with him, so maybe I'll just take a few minutes right now and hurry with my time with God so that I don't be late to have breakfast. Here's a point in your notes. Hurry destroys relationships. I don't know any relationship that's done in a hurry that lasts a long time. Here's another point. You need to create unhurried space in your life to be with God. This is your God time. And you need to make it in a way where nothing encroaches on it. Nothing takes that time. Nothing comes into that space. That, man, I'm, I'm up sometimes 3 o'clock in the morning. And before I do anything, I'm praying for everybody. And I'm seeking God first thing in the morning. And you know what? Sometimes that's like an hour long. But thank goodness it's only 4 o'clock then. I can do it at 3. It's up at 4. At 4 o'clock I'm doing that. And then I'm working on something else. But it's so important for us to create quiet time, relaxing time, and time that's going to be just me and God. And if the phone rings, I'm not answering it. And if, the, you know, if, if I get a text, sorry, I'm not. My phone is in another room because that is my God time. And it has to be yours. See, 
God doesn't want us to rush through our time with them. That was my point about the read through the Bible thing because the when I did that, you know what happened? I would miss a couple of days and then I would try to catch up. You ever try to catch up? Like, I'm behind. I've got to catch up to get where I'm supposed to be. And so then I read it like I'm reading, ba 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 you know, I'm reading this. Okay, now I'm caught up. And then I go, well, what did I read? What did I get out of that? And so I guess you get the point. Here's number three. You need to read Scripture relationally. We're not reading a history book. We're not reading a book of fables, book of stories, where God is teaching us through those messages, through the lives of those before us. He has something he wants us to know. And so we have to do that as if God is sitting in the room with us and he's sharing with us, hey, let me tell you what happened to Paul. You need to know this because it could happen to you. We have to be relational. And so make God's word something that's really important. Uh, Mary, who was sitting at Jesus' feet, understood that. She wanted to have this relationship with him. Martha wasn't so sure. She was so distracted with everything. So you need, to, you need to build that relationship with God by being in his word and understanding he's talking to you. Number four, you have to minimize distractions. You know, the attention span of America's, Americans have gone from 12 seconds down to 8 seconds. Can you imagine that? person can only think for 12 seconds and then they're off to something else. You know what that means? I'm in a lot of trouble. Because I've lost you all about 10 times or something or 20 times or whatever it is. But, it, but it, that's true. We're, our attention span is smaller and smaller and it keeps getting that way. We need to minimize the distractions and we need to do that. If we're going to go deep with God... We have to allow him to transform us on a daily basis. We have to spend time with him without distractions. And we have to allow him to transform us from the inside out. He wants your undivided attention. I don't know where you sit today. I don't know if you feel like I'm trying to have a stronger relationship with him, but I've, I've not had that. Well, then today I'm just inviting you to make today a new day and say, I'm going to change. I'm going to set time aside for God time. And I'm going to hold to that. I'm not going to let anything stop me from doing it. I pray that you do that. Maybe today you don't even know who Jesus is as your Savior, and we never want to leave a service without giving you that opportunity because he wants to come into your life. He wants to be with you. And so, so open your heart. You've tried the world and it's not working. So why don't you join me now in prayer? If you'll pray with me here, if you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, please pray, repeat after me and ask him to come in. And that's the first step to, to eternity with him. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins. I accept you now as my personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen. Time together, we pray, Father, as you, as you uh, guide us this week. Help us, Lord, to seek your face, to build our relationship with you, to grow closer to you in everything that we do. We thank you now for this time.
for being in our, in our lives, for continually guiding us. So be with us now as we leave. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want to talk to...